May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God's saints are those who live upside down. Get that out of the way. <laughs> God's saints are those who live upside down. Taffy had read the Bible upside down. I know that because he told me that. As a university student, um, we went on ecumenical missions. And as part of those, now out of favor, we knocked on doors and spoke to those behind the door. So I knocked on doors in Warrington and in Archway um, and in Whitstable, but also knocked on doors in Thaden Boyce in Essex, which is where I met Taffy. I knocked on Taffy's door. I remember him still opening the door and him saying, it's no good. I've read the Bible upside down and it still makes no sense to me. And I do remember 35 years on resisting the temptation to say, well, if only you stood the right way up, it might make more sense to you. But I knew what he meant. He read it for, he meant to say from end to end. And we then had a long conversation, although I'm not sure that I convinced him. But I remember Taffy, because in some ways, many ways, Taffy was closer to the truth than he realized. God's saints are those who live upside down. The Feast of All Saints... Um, November the 1st, yesterday, is very special to me, partly because I grew up in a church that was All Saints, All Saints Ealing, Ealing Common, um, most remarkable about which was the fact it's the only church in this country built as a memorial to an assassinated Prime Minister, 1812, Spencer Percival, and even more alarming and in those days, I was a server. As we got robed in the corner of the vestry, was a glass case with Spencer Purcell's death mask in it. <laughs> and I remember that being a slightly strange way to prepare for worship. But I was also, for six years, vicar of All Saints Rotherham, sadly a church now at the heart of the agony of that town with all the abuse that's happened there and been disclosed. But in the end, All Saints is not just special because I worshipped as a child in a church called All Saints or because I was a vicar of a church called All Saints, but because the Feast of All Saints points us to that witness of Christian men and women down the ages who in the power of the gospel have lived their lives for Christ in ways that inspire and why do they inspire? Because it's not because they follow the ways and the mores of the world, but because they've lived that upside down, topsy-turvy culture that is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is to be lived out in Christian discipleship. God's saints are those who live upside down. The Beatitudes, that gospel reading that Martin read from us, for us from Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, that celebration of Jesus, blessed are, some modern translations not so good, happy are they, it doesn't have the depth, uh, is a list that I have to say wouldn't impress if you stuck them down on your CV today, you know that tendency now for everybody to write these, you've probably done it, polished CVs that say that John or, I don't know, Angela um, is a confident, go-getting, focused, committed to corporate identity or whatever you say, strong in leadership, um, ready to assume author all those sort of strong things that we think that our world needs. But what does Jesus give us? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who know 
their need of God are the ones who are blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. Could mean all sorts of things, but actually maybe just it's those who are not always optimistic about the potential of the world, but actually recognize all those things in our common life for which we need to mourn. The way we abuse our planet, misuse God's gifts to us. Those who are meek, blessed are the meek. Those who know that the spirit of service is actually the character of love. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who seek the needs of their neighbor first and not of themselves. Wouldn't it be good, you know, John, Jane is a meek, mournful, seeker for justice and righteousness, um, committed to mercy, a different sort of CV. Or if we go to our second reading from the first letter of John, we're called to be the children of God, and the writer says we're not un- we will not be understood by the world, because why? Because the character we are to have in Jesus Christ is that of love, or that love which is seen in Christ, that love that gives all that it is, even to death, the death of our Lord on a cross. Or in our first reading from Revelation, that focus there on those, and Revelation, of course, written to a persecuted church, but celebrating the lives of those who in their commitment to Christ have died for their faith, the martyrs, worshipping around the eternal throne of heaven. God's saints are those who live upside down. And as we rejoice, that's the witness of the church down the ages. But a witness, I suggest to you this morning, is often more radical, more life-changing than we sometimes remember. One of the challenges from the so-called new atheists, the Richard Dawkinses of this world, or the late Christopher Hitchens and all the others in that school, is that actually Christianity really makes no difference. In fact, the the allegation is it makes life worse. Well, I was struck some time ago when I read a book by someone called David Bentley Hart. It's a book called Atheist Delusions. It's not an easy read. But what struck me about the book is that he said he was writing because he wanted to show how radical, how remarkable the impact of Christianity was within what was pagan Roman culture. In the introduction to his book, he says, my chief ambition is to call attention to the peculiar and radical nature of the new faith in that setting. How enormous a transformation of thought Sensibility, culture, morality, and spiritual imagination, Christianity, constituted in the age of pagan Rome. In other words, he says, actually, we have to remember, we have to touch base again with the fact that Christianity, the Christians who lived out what they had witnessed in Christ, was a remarkable witness, radically different to what was there in Roman society. What did it offer in that age of fatalism and occultism and temple worship? Well, first of all, among the things he lists is he says that Christianity conferred a new dignity on human beings. That vision, that universal vision of Christ, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor fever, slave nor free. He says that Christianity created a new sense of moral community, Christian image of the body not as a a, a set of of individuals competing with one another, but the 
the body that is Christ in which each has their part and each makes their valued contribution. He said in particular Christianity raised charity, raised love above all other virtues. The virtues of the age of power and victory and duty. The greatest of these is love. In other words, he says, Christianity actually turned the world upside down. It was not a new fad, not a, just a new style, a new trend. It was a radical new way of living, and that we have to catch hold of and hold on to, an upside down way of living. God's saints are those who live upside down. And as I, as I think we know, in that there is power. Why is Pope Francis catching the attention of so many. Well, it's not that he lives in the Vatican, or technically he's a head of state, or indeed even that he's the leader of 1.2 billion Roman Catholics across the world. Quite a club, quite a group, really, in our world to today. No, it's because he does things, isn't it, like washes the feet of the outcasts and marginalized, because he embraces those who are disfigured, and whom others ignore. Because, okay, yes, realistically within where his church is at the moment, he explores what it means to live a life of love for those whose lives are damaged and broken. That's why he inspires. Or what about Dr. Sarah Ahmed? you might be saying. But if I said Canon Andrew White, most of you would go, ah, yes, Vicar of Baghdad. But if you read Andrew's blog, Dr. Sarah Ahmed is, he, is described as his PA, projects officer, and also a dentist. <laughs> and at the moment, she's in Kurdistan. What's she doing? Living out those beatitude values of mercy, of righteousness, of love and service of peacemaking in all the horrors of Iraq and Syria in that land now where we know that experience of blessed are those who are persecuted, the experience of fellow Christians who are being either forcibly converted or displaced or murdered. Lives that inspire God's saints are those who live upside down. So what's God saying to you and me this morning? What's God saying to us? Well, I think first of all, as always, the gospel calls us to hear afresh Christ's call to us today, particularly to live, to live out his values in our lives and in the world. Maybe today particularly also just hear afresh the testimony of the early church and that remarkable new way that burst in our, to our world in Jesus Christ and those early disciples. Maybe hear afresh the witness of those saints in our world, both past and present. I don't know about you, but I know that I'm one of those people. I'm inspired by what others do. There's a whole list of people who, by seeing the way they live for Christ, have inspired me. Some people need books. Some people need silence and prayer. Some people just need other examples of others, and I'm one of those. Or is it... And these aren't mutually exclusive. You can do all of them. Is it just here afresh the call of Christ to you that, to live as a saint? And how might we do that? Well, I suggest you nothing else. Why don't we just take Matthew 5, those opening verses, those Beatitudes. Maybe just to go home and read it again and hear what God is saying to each one of us. There are, uh, there are eight Beatitudes in particular. Where are we? The poor in spirit, 
those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger for thirst and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted. Take one a day starting today up until next Sunday and just say, just carry that with you through the day and ask, what does that mean? What's Christ saying to me as I live for him? Or is it just to go and Google a few of the contemporary saints of the world and reread their lives and their examples and see what they say to you? But whatever it is, God's saints, and that includes you and me, are those who live upside down. Let's go and do that.